My guest today is the great Dr. Robert Cialdini. He's the Regents Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Marketing at Arizona State University and an award-winning behavioral scientist and author. He's the president and CEO of Influence at Work, focusing on live and virtual keynotes, streaming and online corporate training. In acknowledgement of his outstanding research achievements and contributions in behavioral science, Dr. Cialdini was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. He has over 230 professional and scientific publications and is known as the foundational expert in the science of influence and is frequently referred to as the godfather of influence. Well, that's pretty obvious why. The book is called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. It's probably, I don't know, one of the handful of the best-selling psych books ever. And uh, it's got a new edition now, and I listened to the whole thing. It was, I don't know, like 20-something hours on audio. Fabulous read. He reads it, which I like. Uh, but the you know the, the the updates include current events, things from just the, even during the pandemic. So it's nice to get that uh, update. So we go through uh, his seven uh, principles of persuasion that are part of his universal principles of influence. Uh, we talk about the good and evil uses of these principles. They could be put to good use or to bad use. Um, and we talk about um, to what extent humans are naturally gullible and fall for these kinds of influences or are we naturally skeptical and it takes a lot of work to get us to uh, be influenced by these uh, these factors uh, we talk about to what extent we're rational or not rational this is the kind of debate between Kahneman and uh, Ginger Enzer uh, and uh, to what extent that you know if you give subjects these logical puzzles logic puzzles to solve that we're really bad at it particularly if they involve probabilities and statistics but if you put it in a social context we're much better at solving those kinds of problems. Uh, we talk about free will and determinism, pluralistic ignorance, Jonestown, Heaven's Gate, Nexium, Scientology, fundamentalist Mormons, you know, why people join cults, when they join cults, Milgram's uh, obedience to authority shock experiments and informity experiments, and then we wrap up uh, discussing current events, Israel and Palestine, uh, Derek Chauvin in the George Floyd case. What were those other cops doing standing there just watching and why don't people um you know bystanders say something sometimes they do why doesn't it work sometimes it does when does it doesn't work and so on and then i ask him to give us kind of a bigger perspective of how optimistic he is about the future of moral progress uh, giving all these psychological factors at work all right thanks for listening Robert Cialdini, nice to see you, man. It's been a few years. I think I had you at uh, Cal- at our Caltech series for your, was it your persuasion book? Yes, it was. And I remember it uh, very favorably, yes. our, our interaction. <laughs> I remember you had a funny line at the end, because uh, you have your seven principles of persuasion, and and uh, people would forget them, like, you know, who are the seven dwarves of the sea? Sleepy, grumpy, dopey, and I can't remember <laughs> the other four, and you had a, yeah, a little right. mnemonic. Maybe, yeah. maybe you'll give that to us today. Uh, but before we get into all that, I will have already given you a formal introduction, but um, for our listeners who have been abducted by aliens and been on uh, Vega for the last 25 years and don't know your work and who you are, give us a little potted biography, autobiography of you know where you're from, where you grew up, where you went to college, and why you got interested in psychology in general and, and the psychology of persuasion in particular. Well, I'm a behavioral scientist with an emphasis on persuasion science, uh, social influence. Uh, something that I can track to uh, where I grew up. I grew up in uh, an entirely Italian family in a predominantly Polish neighborhood in a historically German city, Milwaukee, in an otherwise rural state. And I noticed that when I would move from one of those settings to the other, the codes of conduct would change. The rules and the uh, conventions of how people interacted and what was appropriate and so on would change. And I realized that it wasn't, there wasn't any one best way to arrange for people to want to move in the direction I was hoping they would move. The, th- the, the, the rules of the game would change from setting to setting. And I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? And num- one of a, a number of, uh, uh, of epiphanies, I, isn't that interesting? It's not only one thing. There are different norms and conventions and mores and so on that condition 
how I would want to be an optimal communicator. So that helped uh, in, in the process. The other thing I noticed, in, even in those days, uh, that I, is that I was a sucker. I was a patsy. I was an easy mark for the appeals of various kinds of salespeople or fundraisers that would come to my door, and I would stand in unwanted possession of <laughs> tickets to the sanitation workers' ball or, what, you know, <laughs> magazine subscriptions to Beekeeper's Digest. And what? how did this happen? Well, <laughs> it must have been something other than the merits of the case. It must have been the way the merits of the case were presented that swept me in some sort of psychological way to say, yes, isn't that interesting? <laughs> so it was one of the things that keyed my focus on the, the process of influence and the way that messaging um, drives that process. And where'd you go to school and what did you study there? Experimental psych? You know, undergraduate, University of Wisconsin, and then I went to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill um, and uh, <clears throat> was a, a golden time for me. I mean, graduate school opened opportunities for me. Here's something that's interesting about when I look back. I was a better uh, high school student than an elementary school student, and I was a better college student than high school student, and I was a better graduate student than college student, and I think I'm a better professional than I was a graduate student. And I think the way to best understand that is that at each of those levels, I was afforded more degrees of freedom to decide what was worth studying, what really resonated with my interests and my uh, focus uh, at that particular time in terms of what was worth my effort and, and investigative uh, you know, uh, undertakings. And that just helped me become resonant with in myself and with the things I was doing, the people around me were no longer telling me at each level, this is what you should be interested in. This is worth studying. I, I got to do that myself and I think benefited from it. Yeah, I like that degrees of freedom idea because that's how I felt when I went to college from high school. It, it, you know, high school, you're just there all day, like it's a job. And then in college, right. it's like, okay, so Tuesday, Thursday, I go from 1 to 2.30 and then that's it? I'm I could do whatever I want. Yeah, you could do whatever you want. Monday, Wednesday, right. Friday, I got three hours, and that's it. And okay, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then I could see the college well, professors were getting paid for the same kind of schedule. I thought that's the job. <laughs> that's the job I want. <laughs> well, for me, it was the increase in the thing that they called the electives. In grade school, we didn't have electives. You just did what the teacher, in my case, the nuns, told us to do, right? And then in high school, there were a couple at the end. You got to choose some things. In college, you got to choose them throughout the process. And in graduate school, after the master's degree, essentially what my professors told me was, in implicitly said, okay, You've now shown us you know how to do this. Now it's your choice. Go. Decide what to do on your own. Decide what your PhD thesis should be about. It's all electives now. It's all what you choose to dive into. And then I did a postdoctoral uh, fellowship with Stanley Schachter at Columbia University where, yeah, where... I learned something that my prior mentors didn't really provide to the same degree. Uh, my major professor was Chet Insko, who taught me the logician's trade, essentially, in research. How to move from an idea, let's say a theory or a hypothesis, in a logical extension to a way to test that. In other words, to trap an idea, a, 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 
phenomenon. If it was there, we would build a structure to, to uh, snare it. The other important mentor at UNC was John Thiebaud, who was a kind of a Renaissance man. And instead of trapping a phenomenon by building a, an experimental a device for uh, snaring it, if it was true, it, we were going to catch it. We figured out all the, the, the details of that trap. John would circle it in increasingly tight circles. So, for example, if we went into a, um, a research meeting, and let's say the question was, how do people bargain, negotiate differently when they are representing a constituency versus when they're just bargaining for themselves, when they have a responsibility to a group, right? How does that affect the way they interact and, and choose alternatives? And he would say, well, what if the great novelists of our time said it? Right? He, he, about the notion of responsibility for the welfare of others and having to carry that forth. And then he would say, now, after we discuss, what have, what have the philosophers said? So we'd move from Henry James to William James, right? And then he would say, what have our sister disciplines said? What have the political scientists said? What have the sociologists said? What have the anthropologists and econo economists said? And then finally, he would say, now, we're social psychologists. What have our colleagues said about this in, in the literature? What, what already exists right, that we can uh, uh, use as a starting point? And it occurred to me, this is where everybody else would start. John finished there after providing all of the context for this and insights from a variety of other disciplines and, and starting points. Yeah, that's really that's and then, interesting. It's a very interdisciplinary, very important. Yeah, he was he was a Renaissance man, and he, he it was important to him. I mean, if you look at like the last the century picture. of the academy, it's become ever more balkanized, where the you know the political scientists and the economists are in one building, and the psychologists are in some other building. Historians and the English lit professors are in still another building. We don't know each other, don't talk to each other rarely, uh, but we should. And this is why your book is, uh, I think, is so appealing because it it, it it draws from a wide variety of sources, all the ones you just listed. Interesting that you attribute that to mentors. You know, I'm, I'm always interested in how lives turn out. Yeah. You know, after Obama's famous speech about, you know, you didn't build that. You had you know, somewhere along the line, you had a teacher, you had a mentor, somebody nudged you, somebody encouraged you. And, you know, we all need to acknowledge that, you know, that Americans tend to think of themselves as, you know, rugged individualists. I did it all on my own. No one helped me. It's like, that's not possible. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Everybody gets help and, and borrows from no. each other. You know, Hillary Clinton was right. It takes a village, really. <laughs> So yeah. behind you, I trust I'm looking at the foreign translations of of uh, influence, and uh, I trust yeah. 40 uh, foreign language translations. That's a uh, a sign that we're up to 44. 44. Okay, well <laughs> we're up to 44 now. I think we got Mong recently. I, I wanted to read, uh, <laughs> you, you know, from from your opening preface to the the new edition here. From the outset, influence was designed for the popular reader, and as such, an attempt was made to write it in a non-academic conversational style. I admit to doing so with some trepidation that the book would be viewed as a form of pop psychology by my academic colleagues. I was concerned because, as the legal scholar James Boyle observed, you have never heard true condescension until you heard an, uh, academics pronounce the word popularizer. Oh, he's a mere popularizer. Right, yeah. right. I wanted to comment on that because I, right. I think that uh, that is a big mistake when academics think about that. I, I, I think far fewer do than, than we think, and that's good. But, you know, there's this idea of the two cultures, you know, C.P. Snow's two cultures, you know, you have the hard sciences and then the humanities. And really, there's a third culture in between that is writing books that are for everybody to read, uh, scientific books that are for everybody to read. But they're not the dumbed down popular version of the technical version. They're the only version there is. I mean, you can go back to Darwin's On the Origin of Species. It's a very readable book. 
it, but it's not the popular version of his technical papers. It's the only version there is. Or Dawkins, the selfish gene, or Pinker's uh, better angels yeah. or enlightenment. Now, just just pick any of these, you know, Dan Dennett's books, and so I I put yours in that category. You're you know everybody should read this book. The, the references are there in tiny little end notes, and you can look them up if you need to. If you're an academic, fine, uh, but you don't need that, and therefore that's the I think broad appeal. And that, that's the way it should be. That's good. You you know, there's a humorous story associated with those end notes and all the references and so on. They're they're a significant part of the the pagination. You know, there there are a lot of pages devote, devoted to that, and I was at. A conference. Uh, it was uh, e-marketers, right? So people, uh, electronic marketing, big, big deal these days. And there was a woman who uh, approached me. She said, "You know, uh, I love your book, and uh, but I, I, I really have a, a, a question, a bit of a critique. Why do you have all those endnotes? Why do you have all those citations? We don't need that." I mean, we believe you. We, <laughs> we, we're assigning you the role of authority, of expert on the topic. That's all we need to believe that you're... And so I tried to give her a, a, a series of explanations. Well, one is those people deserve acknowledgement. Uh, they did the research. I, they, they should be recognized for it. Another is uh, anybody who wants to follow this up uh, to do future research on it, we'll have a place to start, and they can use the reference sections within those articles. And uh, and 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 besides, I, I want to be able to demonstrate that what I'm talking about is not anecdote. It's not this. This isn't speculation. Look, there's there's evidence, and I was not getting across to her at all. I could see from her nonverbal language she wasn't buying. And then I, rec I, I remember saying to myself, Cialdini, put yourself in her shoes. Who is she? She is a, a, a e-marketer. She's an electronic marketer. This is what she does. And then I said, okay, and besides, it's my brand. And she said, okay, then I get it. It's congruent with the image you need to present as a person who uh, does this for a popular audience and uh, is credible and uh, and research based in the process. It's part of your brand. Then I get it. <laughs> Not the real reasons that I did it. Well, I also or, think it's good to. It's what a marketer would say. It is say. good to acknowledge where our <laughs> ideas come from too. I think it's a an ethical thing to do because no. none of us invent ideas from uh, out of whole cloth we all build on each other and i always find it irritating when i see authors that are clearly using other people's ideas and they don't acknowledge it and they, they act like you know this this is original to them and i know it's not and i find that a little uh you know unfair so you know i'm glad you do that well so um i also wanted to before we go through the seven principles um you know, just to acknowledge, as you do in the book, that, you know, there's sort of a, 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 a good side to this. You know, good people can use these influencing principles to, you know, mm -hmm. make the world a better place. But also bad people use them. Uh, I was thinking about this uh, when I had David Buss on the uh, podcast last week. Where he has a new book on uh, why men be when men, men behave badly, but also why. And uh, so he has this crazy story in the book about how um, there's these dating sites uh, not, not dating sites, but sites for men of how to escalate uh, a relationship quickly to sex uh, with with women. And so right. they use these evolutionary psych principles, like there's a sex difference between how much time you want to spend with somebody before you're willing to have sex with them. And and for men, it's like, well, first date's fine with me. And for women, it's like, no, no, I, I need at least seven different you know conversations, encounters, dates, you know, seven units of we've interacted before. <clears throat> I'm willing to do that. So David says there's some site where they tell you, take her out on the first date to seven different places to trick her into thinking <laughs> that, you know, they, you've been together way more and, and then therefore you, you're more likely to get laid. And, and of course, he says it's disparagingly, like, this is not why we're doing this research. Clearly, the information that you provide could be used, uh, you know, for like cult leaders yes. or somebody like a Bernie Madoff to draw people in. And you even talk about Bernie Madoff there. So... And how do you think about, you know, these principles that are used for good and evil? 
Well, um, in a couple of ways. One is, I know that community that you're talking about. They call themselves the seduction community. And they have been knocking on my door ever since the first edition of Influence came out. Can you speak to our group? Can you be on our podcast? Can you be a, a, an interviewee to help our uh, constituents uh, learn how to influence women into bed, essentially? And one way I deal with it is to say, no, <laughs> no, that's not what I'm going to do. I have some information that can be used for uh, good or nefarious purposes, uh, but I'm not going to provide that information to people whose intent is to exploit with it, right? Uh, and, 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 and it also uh, applies to the way that I present the information when I do public speaking to business groups and so on. I never give examples of people who have succeeded by exploiting the information, by by using it for ill. I only give examples of how people have been successful in the ethical application of the influence uh, strategy. So that's one way, you know, just... Bob, let's go through the uh, the seven principles of persuasion. I know you can do this, uh, you know, with your eyes closed and half your brain tied behind your back, standing on one leg. <laughs> so you don't have to go on and on too too long about it, but just kind of summarize the seven. Yes, I am familiar with them. <laughs> um, they they they've been good to me. I have to say, you know, I. I uh, you know, when I wrote Influence, put one per chapter, and, uh, and and the book has sold more copies than I could have sensibly imagined in more languages than I could. You know, there, I have this, uh, I have a Polish colleague, uh, Professor Wilhelmina Wosinska, who said to me, you know, Bob, your book Influence is so famous in Poland, my students think you're dead. <laughs> I love that story <laughs> in the book. Yes, yeah, too funny. Thought, whoa. <laughs> Whoa, that's sobering. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe it's time for a <laughs> update. Yes, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I let, them have, right, let that's people really know, no, still kicking, <laughs> still thinking. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, yes, the six principles. We can begin with reciprocity or reciprocation, the, the rule that exists in all human cultures uh, that obligates me to give back to you the form of behavior you have first provided to me. And, you know, if, if you invite me to a party, I should invite you to one of mine. You remember my birthday with a card, I should remember yours. And Michael, if you do me a favor, I owe you a favor. And I'll say very simply, in the context of obligation, people say yes to the requests of those they owe. Right? So uh, here's a, you know, there's a lovely little study uh, in, done in a candy shop in Southern California that makes this point. Um, one week, researchers arranged for the manager of this shop to greet half of the people who came in warmly and then escort, escort them to the candy counter where they could make their choices. The other half were greeted warmly and given a small piece of chocolate and then escorted to the candy counter, where they were 42% more likely to purchase if they received that gift. And I can see the critics saying, well, that's not reciprocity. Maybe they just liked the candy. Maybe just liked the... If you look into the data, the great majority did not buy chocolate. They bought something else. In other words, it wasn't that they loved chocolate that, uh, no, that they got. No, it wasn't even what they had received. It was that they had received that made the difference. The key is to go first with reciprocity. It's the opposite of the usual commercial exchange sequence in which people say to us, if you will buy our product, if you will uh, become a member of our organization, if you will vote for our candidate, we will give back to you the best outcomes you could have imagined in this. So this is what we promise. We give back to you if you have first moved. Reciprocity says, no, you go first. That's asking them to go first. And there's a lovely study, uh, uh, not even published yet, 
in McDonald's restaurants done in uh, South America, in Brazil and Colombia. Researchers arranged for uh, families who came into a particular location there to receive a balloon for each child. Half of them got the balloon as they left, half got the balloon as they entered. Those families who got the balloon as they entered bought 20% more food. And, in, and inside that 20%, there was a 25% increase in coffee orders. Kids weren't drinking coffee. But we know, you do something for my child, you've done something for me. We'll get to this with the last principle of uh, uh, of uh, unity uh, later on. But the idea is you go first. You have to go first, and then all kinds of uh, positive things come to you. Uh, but anyway, uh, here's what I would... Uh, let's move on to well, the next. Let, but let, me, give you, let me give you an example. A, so my, my yeah. Aunt Mary worked at Seas Candies for like 35 years. And so uh, they, and that was their principle. You get a free piece of candy when you walk in. And they even have signs. Ask us for your free candy. And they ask every person, that looks, would you like a free sample? And obviously that, that worked for them because they are the most successful candy company in the world, I think. Uh, they are. Yeah, That's yeah. right. And uh, McDonald's. Well, I have a five-year-old well, son now, so uh, I know all about the McDonald's free stuff because he tells me about it all the time. Let's go to McDonald's because <laughs> I got to get the full set of the collectible toys that come with the Happy Meal. <laughs> anyway, yeah, no dummies there at McDonald's. They know what they're doing. So here's my advice <clears throat> when people say, so if, if I'm in a new situation, I'm, I'm a new employee or I'm in a new department, I go into a meeting with people, I want them on my side, I want to be able to influence them, what's the best strategy to employ? And what I say is when you go into that room, the best question you should ask yourself is not, who can most help me here, but whom can I most help here? If you go and enhance the outcomes and elevate the circumstances of somebody in that room, that person will stand ready to do the same for you. That's the way you approach a new situation. Well, I had another example <laughs> that I, I'll never forget this. It's so powerful. But at a dinner, and I think it was during TED or one of these conferences, and I was out to dinner with a couple friends at, at a restaurant, and all of a sudden the waiter brings over a tray of uh, sushi. I'm like, well, I didn't order sushi. And, and she says, yeah, that guy over there did for you. And I look over and there's Dan Ariely, the behavioral economist. I went, oh, and he's like, or, gotcha. Right. And I'm like, yeah. I'll never forget that. I mean, that was like 10 years ago. I've been waiting <laughs> to see him so I could reciprocate because I feel like this, that was really nice. I got to do something in return. In fact, we say that one of the factors that um, activates and not, not activates, but enhances the power of reciprocity, is unexpected favors. Personalized favors as well as unexpected favors really do um, build muscle into the, into the system. Yeah. So that also explains why you get those envelopes that have like a free pin or, a, or a, well, I used to get these $2 Jefferson bills, which I really liked, but then I felt guilty because oh, I, yeah. kept, I yeah, kept piling yeah. them up in my desk. Uh, and, and so finally, I did whatever they asked me to do. I think it was fill out a survey or something like that. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty basic. This is what happens. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's normal. Okay, commitment and consistency. Commitment and consistency, uh, another rule uh, that I believe is socialized into us rather than having been evolved uh, as, into us as a species. But it is the desire to be consistent with what we have already said or done, especially in public. Right? So that we, we want to be seen as somebody who lives up to his or her commitments, who, uh, who acts in a way that's congruent with what they say they're going to do, their promises and so on, or their, their statements, the positions they take. We want to see ourselves as consistent, but we also want the people around us to see us as consistent. So uh, 
it's it's it, it, it's something that a communicator can do and i think ethically is to identify something about an uh, a recipient that is uh, has already been uh, made a, a, a stance or a, a a value or a preference and then show how what you have to offer is logically consistent with that just and then the pull of the rule of consistency uh, re results. Uh, and uh, I, I, there's a, another restaurant story I like that helps make this point. I'm using restaurants because we've all been in restaurants. Right? Every, every one of us knows that se setting. Uh, it's a, a study done uh, in a Chicago restaurant, Gordon's Restaurant, where they were having a problem of uh, no-shows. Uh, Thirty percent, in fact, of people who would book a table didn't appear or didn't call to cancel. And so the proprietor, a guy named Gordon Sinclair, who was a student of the influence process, uh, listened to what his receptionist said when she would take uh, a reservation. And she would say, thank you for calling Gordon's. Please call if you have to change or cancel your reservation. We've heard that many. He asked her to add two words. Will you please call if you have to change your cancel reservation? And then pause. The pause was key because it allowed people to make a commitment to that behavior. They would all say, yes, of course, sure, glad to. And no-shows dropped from 30% to 10% immediately because of that one more breath that was employed in the reception process. This is what I like about these principles. They really, uh, they don't take much in terms of time or effort or expense uh, to produce big effects because what they do is activate big tendencies within us. It's not the words that are uh, producing that effect. It's that they, they release the power of systems that are already installed in us, like to be consistent uh, with what we've said or done, or uh, to, to give to those people we owe. I mean, those are just big systems that have been put in us, and all you need to do is essentially flip the switch that allows their power to flow. Uh, there are evolutionary psychologists who think we did evolve a system like that, on which culture then operates, for example, I think it's Tubi and Cosmetes that write about um, reputation management, one, of, one characteristic of which is that you're con a consistent person. I can trust you. Uh, you're reliable. You're a good group mate. You're a good tribe mate that, you know, if times are bad for me, I know you'll help me. Therefore, I'll help you when times are bad for you. You have to be consistent about that. Anyway, that's just a kind of a side note on that. Uh, but you also have that. No, yeah. I, I think that's right. But uh, my, my sense is uh, that that is socialized into us uh, as well. And I think for reasons having to do with uh, the need for uh, pr the, a, a positive reputation. And, and yeah, well, so you have that story about Jack Nicholas, the great golfer whose grand, his grandson died, and therefore he canceled his uh, going forth participation in the PGA, major PGA tournament. But then he still uh, did a couple other obligations he had already committed to. And, and you made an interesting reference to that, but because he's American. So there you're referencing maybe some of these principles are more Western in orientation uh, versus other cultures. So speak about that a little bit. Yeah, because we tend to be individualistically oriented. The standard for choice in the U.S. and Western Europe is often well what i look inside myself what what are my preferences what are my values what are my attitudes what have i said or done on this and then i make my decision based on that internal look uh and so uh what uh, what jack Nis nicholas claims uh spurred him to do this in this time of tragedy where he just bailed out of the master's tournament, but he, he still agreed to play in a, a, a celebrity tournament for one of his friends and so on. He had made that previous commitment, and he felt driven to live up to it, right? Uh, because 
it was he looked at what he had said or done previously to determine what he should do next. We did a study a few years ago looking at which principles of influence were most uh, successful in the U.S. versus Poland, which had a much more collectivistic culture. And we found that in the U.S. it was um, what I have done previously most determines what I will choose next to do. In Poland, it was what have my friends done previously on this topic? It was social proof, the idea that the, 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 the collective is the standard that I use rather than the individual. They were looking outside of themselves for evidence of what's the best thing to do. What, what, is, what are the people in my network doing? That's my best evidence of what I should be doing. So cultures maybe nudge up or down which of the six principles is dominant in any particular context. Not that none of us have, uh, uh, you know, the, the third one or the fifth one or whatever. Everybody has some degree of these uh, principles that work in their in their minds in these cultural contexts, but the culture itself uh, bumps them around a little. That's a bullseye uh, observation. What my view of the research shows is that all of these principles apply across cultures. You will, you know, but the weights associated the priorities associated with them change from culture to culture. Yeah, so the third one, social proof, I think is one of the most powerful. I was thinking about that uh, in the context of these 1960s, 70s classic psych experiments like the uh, smoke in the room. So we replicated some of these for a Dateline NBC uh, show, I, a series I did with uh, uh, Chris Harrison, and uh, Chris Hansen, and uh, uh, you know, I got to think of when we set it up, you know, we got a bunch of stooges in a room filling out a, a form to apply for this game show on NBC, right? And, uh, you know, th th and they're all shills except for the one guy sitting there. You know how this works, right? So we start pumping in theater smoke underneath yeah. the door, and all our shills, of course, are just sitting there dutifully filling out their form. They don't even look up. And our poor guy is like, he's looking left, he's looking right, he's looking at each person. And he's like, all right, well, the hell with it. I guess I'll go back to my form. You know, he's looking for social proof, like, and, and so we often kind of laugh about that, like people are stupid to conform to a, a group, like Solomon Ash's famous lines experiment. But in a way, in a, in, a, in a real world environment, if there really was a fire, people wouldn't be sitting there. They'd do right. something. So it, it right. pay, it's right. actually logical. There's a, there's a logic to following what other people are doing, because none of us can know everything. So we depend on other people for information that we can rely on. I always like the, the flip side example of that. So suppose on 9-11, you're in New York and you're walking down the street and you see a bunch of people running away from a particular uh, area, you would be a fool not to follow their lead. If you went in, you know, that then you might be at risk. The building could fall. I mean, it, it makes great sense, evolutionary sense, it seems to me, for sure in this instance, to, to move away uh, when people are moving away and to move towards something when most of, of those like us are doing that. I think another one of those optimizing factors in these principles for uh, social proof is comparability of the others. If they're like me, then that's good information about what I should do in this situation. I get to reduce my uncertainty of what I should do, not by looking inside this time. Because if, if there's uncertainty, it doesn't make sense to look inside. All I get is the confusion. I need to look outside and, and what we are calling in, in the new version of the book, persuasion. Is, is the most powerful source of information uh, that we can, uh, we can access along with the next principle of influence, which is authority. What are the experts saying? Again, we're look, when we're uncertain, we look outside, and that's when we're most likely to be susceptible to the information that a communicator can present about what the knowledgeable people the authorities are saying 
Yeah. Thinking about that, when I was reading that section on, uh, you discussed Milgram's famous shock experiments. Now, of course, his whole book is premised on this obedience to authority. He was testing obedience to authority. Of course, I've always wondered, how do you know that's what's going on inside somebody's brain? Uh, I mean, you're calling it obedience to authority. And then, but I got to thinking, well, maybe it's also social proof in a way. This guy is a, is a scientist. He's got the white coat on. I trust the institution of science as a kind of a, as a social proof that institutions of a democracy are, we should trust them unless they're obviously breaking down. And here I am at Yale University. I mean, what are the chances that, uh, you know, this guy's going to actually die if I give him electric shocks? So, you know, maybe it's not obedience to authority, or maybe it is partially obedience to authority, but maybe it's also, you know, kind of social validation that I trust this system, that these people know what they're doing. Yeah, uh, that's that's uh, a, a possibility. It, it other people have looked at that and come down still on the uh, on the principle of authority, uh, because uh, if, for example, um, somebody who is not in authority um, uh, makes these kinds of requests, you don't get the effect. If another subject makes that request, which would be social proof, you know, you don't get it. Although if you, in one of the variations of the experiment, if there was another subject in the room who resisted the authority, then the real subject was more likely to also mm -hmm. uh, resist the authority. Right. So that would be social proof, right. right? It's not, that would be social proof. Yeah, it's not like these things only work in, in one particular, only one at a time. They Here's something I've learned. If you see a big phenomenon, a big effect in human behavior, it's usually caused by more than one factor. It, there, it's, it's, it's multiple causation <laughs> that produces it. We, in our experiments, try to identify one of them by uh, eliminating the influence of the others and just to see, is, is this one of them? Yes, this is one of them. Doesn't mean it's the only one that's working in naturally occurring sense. Yeah, I've been talking a lot about the replication crisis on this podcast. Part of the problem is that uh, the scientists are putting forward, like, the, here's this one variable that explains, you know, everything I'm trying to understand. And it almost never happens that way. It's the power pose, or it's the mindset, or it's the Right, you know the the prime the the uh, cognitive priming, or it's it's oxytocin, or it's you know it's just this one thing, and it's never just one. Thing. Right, and this is why I'm a big proponent of field research, where we do experiments in naturally occurring settings where all of these factors are still in there. <laughs> You know, what other people are doing, how many people are going by, how much distraction there is, and all, all that stuff that we eliminate from the laboratory and the field. Those things are still going on. If you get an effect there, it, it doesn't mean that's the only one that's working, but it means it's strong enough to appear even in that uh, milieu of all kinds of uh, extraneous uh, influences. Okay, liking. We liked people that like us. And <laughs> okay. We like people who like us. And, and that no one, uh, no one in your audience would be surprised that, well, that that's the case. But there are a couple of interesting features of the research literature on liking or uh, general attraction for, for a communicator and willingness to say yes to that person. One is that if we are such a communicator, we can greatly increase the likelihood of that feeling of rapport uh, by identifying genuine similarities between us or identifying genuine compliments to give. Those two factors, once again, enhance the power of the liking rule uh, for influence. Genuine is the key word there. You got to really mean it. And, well... Uh, in, in other words, because people, yes, uh, otherwise, people know you're bullshitting. If you're a, if you're a con artist, most people kind of have a sense like, I don't know, there's, I'm not vibing this guy. He's, the stuff he's telling me sounds like he's just trying to snowball me. He doesn't really believe it. Yeah, we're always on the lookout 
for the con. We're always looking for the kind of person who might be uh, counterfeiting the evidence of liking or whatever it is in the situation. Um, there's a there's a lovely little study on uh, star ratings on um, review sites for various kinds of products or services or books and so on. And what they find is that the most effective star rating for producing a purchase, a con what they call a conversion, right, from a prospect to a customer, is not a five-star rating. It's, it's a range from 4.2 to 4.7. If you're below four, yeah, if you're below 4.2, people say, ah, oh, maybe this isn't such a great thing. But if you're above 4.7, they say, wait a minute. He's rigged this. <laughs> this may, yeah, somebody's rigging the system. You can't get all five. <laughs> right, Come right. on. Right. And so you, you, yeah, we're, we've got our, we've got our radar set up to try to scan. And certainly liking is one of those things, especially in terms of one thing that um that causes us to like another person smiles we like people who smile but it turns out we can detect a phony smile right. it's the, the, genuine. the muscles here the crinkle of the eyes Duchenne. yeah yeah the dushin smile and here's a little i'm off to the side here with this story but um i i got a great lesson from somebody uh, uh while i was First beginning my speaking, you know, career, public speaking career, uh, I, I was doing a talk for a, a charity organization. Uh, every year I choose one particular charity and, and will speak for them uh, gratis. And uh, this one, uh, they said, but you know what we will do? Uh, if you'll do this for us, we have somebody on our board who is a, a coach, a speaker's coach. And he would agree to hear your talk, be in the audience for your talk, and then spend a morning or an afternoon with you, giving you uh, hints as how to, tips, as how to improve your presentation. I said, okay, fine. So I did talk, and then uh, we met um, for about a morning. And Michael, I don't remember a single thing he told me, except one, one thing. And it has changed the way I present uh, my, myself in, in these uh, stage presentations. He said, you know, Cialdini, you have kind of a wide mouth. You have a big mouth. <laughs> and he didn't say, therefore, when you come on the stage, smile broadly at your audience. He said, find a reason to smile broadly at your audience. So you mean it. You actually feel Make it. Make it genuine. Yeah. Yes. Make it genuine. This was before that research even came out, showing that people can detect the difference. He knew that I was going to be different and my audience was going to be different if I had hooked into something about the situation or them or my material that I could genuinely smile about. And I, and now that's what I do before every talk. That's great. What do you think about what makes you smile? Well, it could be something like, oh, this is an audience where my material will, they really could benefit from this. I know I'm going to get a good response from this. Or this is a group that I, I've never talked to before, so they haven't heard my material. Or I know that there's a friend of mine in the front row who, who is going to be a supporter of me uh, throughout this talk and afterwards and so on. I, just something, oh, there's Jim. Uh, hi, Jim. You know, uh, uh, just uh, something. It's like, what do you do when you, you have guests come to your home for dinner? You, you you want to treat them like that. You you want to you want to be positive and and and, and smile at them for a genuine reason because <laughs> you like them. That you're anticipating a conversation over dinner that's going to be. Fun. Here I'm thinking of uh, Bob Trivers' work on deception and self-deception. Yeah, that we have kind of an evolutionary arms race between 
uh, trying to deceive others ourselves, but not get detected that that's what we're doing because we also have, you know, reasonably good but not perfect systems of detecting when someone else is lying. Lie detection is not very reliable. Uh, but uh, but but the idea that it's better if you actually believe it yourself, uh, because then you won't give off the tells that you're you know you're manipulating somebody. And apparently, people with the dark triad, you know, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and psychopathy are fairly good at cueing people that they're genuine, even though they're not. And so that's mm. why. And, and mm -hmm. the argument is that um, you know we're pretty good at people uh, detecting people that are uh, bullshitting us who are not very good at it. But these people with the the, the the triad, dark triad, they've had their whole lives to practice it. And this is why, and, and, uh -huh. and so uh -huh. the argument is that natural selection would have never gotten rid of 100% of psycho psychopaths and bullies. Yeah. And so on. We just don't have the yeah. resources yeah. to get rid of yeah. all of them. So, you know, we tolerate 1% to 3%, say, psychopaths. Most of them are, you know, just running Wall Street companies or politicians or their CEOs or whatever. You know, most of them are not serial killers or whatever. But um, then one more element on that. See, for me, um, you know, when I talk about secular ethics and, you know, that, without God, can you really have true right and wrong, good and evil, and a sense of guilt and shame and pride and joy? Yes, I argue, because you can't fake being a moral person. Because eventually your fellow tribe members who know you, spend a lot of time with you, they're, they're going to know you're just, you know, conning them. you got to actually feel it, believe it, live it. And that's true morality. I mean, if I genuinely care about you and I want to do something nice for you and it makes me feel good and it makes you feel good, that's as good as it gets. Yes, and this has to do with something, I think, within this, uh, this category of liking. We talked about, you know, uh, uh, finding real, genuine similarities, giving genuine compliments. It turns out that we are suckers for flattery. The person who receives the compliment, who receives the praise, who when you uh, say to your uh, your boss, "Oh, that was a brilliant idea. That was just uh, you know, I, I never thought of that. That you're, this is why you make the big bucks, whatever." Your boss might believe it, but your colleagues who hear you say it don't believe it, and they assign that deceptive trait to you, which is which then deselects your genetic. Yeah, um, this guy's a brown noser and we know it. We all know what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is a liar. This is a cheater. This is a guy, I, you know, I can't believe him. All right. Now under liking, do you include things like attractiveness, you know, height? There's studies showing that, you know, tall politicians are more likely to get elected than shorter ones. Attractive women have more doors open for them, both literally and figuratively. And so on, even teachers treat uh, uh, cute children, you know, better than they treat less attractive children and so on. Is that under the liking category? Yeah. And has have those studies held up? It is. They're replicable. Yes, they're, they're replicable. There's, uh, there's clear evidence of this uh, for um, things associated with appearance, and they seem to produce a halo effect where we then assign people who are attractive, positive, in uh, that physical space, uh, attractive, positive traits uh, in addition, like intelligence and honesty, even. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a recent book that's written, and I'm blanking on the name of the author, but he, he uh, reviewed years of research, including uh, some recent work, on the likelihood that an attractive person would gain significantly uh, in terms of um, a salary, wage, a, a size of a first offer of, a, and a job, and so on. And he said, and uh, I'm not saying this uh, out of some form of uh, bragging, he said, because I figure on a 10-point scale, I'm a three. <laughs> <laughs> but but I right, right. but I see this. I see it in the data. I don't want it to be there, but there it is. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of like the larger conversation about income inequality and and whether we live in a fair and just society, and it's not fair or just to treat people based on the color of their skin or their gender and so on. Uh, but 
But on the other hand, there are a lot of advantages. Some people, they're just lucky to be tall or good looking or whatever. And, uh, you know, what we can't control for that. It's just, you know, that's just genetics and whatever, enough money to have a, a trainer <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and good clothes or whatever. But it, 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 clearly it does make a right. difference. It's never going to be really a truly fair society in that sense. Right. That's right. But I think what's comforting <clears throat> for the rest of us who are not, you know, the, 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 the movie star types, is that there are these other things that also uh, influence the, the, uh, the sense of uh, rapport that people feel with us. And uh, two of them are something that we can um, be detectives of the influence process, and that is find genuine commonalities and find genuine uh, 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 praiseworthy traits that we can give uh, authentic um, compliments uh, about. I'll tell you a funny story. It's years ago, I was, uh, had to go to the mall to pick up something at this store that was only at the mall. I hate going to the mall because you got to park, get the ticket, and then you got to pay on the way out and so on. And I was in a big rush. And, oh, God. And yeah. so I'm in a line of cars and they're going through the gate, you know, pay, pay. Finally, the car in front of me, it, I don't know what was going on, but I just could not get the thing to work. And you get credit card, credit card, not working. And I'm just, you know, boiling there. I'm just like, I'm. So yeah, finally, yeah. I decide I'm going to get out of the. I'm getting out of. I'm going to go give this guy a piece of my mind. So I go walking up there like, "What's the problem?" But and it's this gorgeous woman, and she just looks really upset, like she's having the worst day of of, her, of the year. And I'm like, and within like 200 milliseconds, I'm like, "Is there anything I could do to help?" <laughs> Could I pay? Yeah, I have a credit yeah, card. I'll pay for it. I did. I said I'll pay for it. You know, I mean, then, I, then afterwards, I'm thinking, God, Shermer, that what are you? Just an ape? And it's like, yeah, actually, I'm just yeah. an ape. <laughs> you know, I had one of those experiences on a plane uh, along with two of my colleagues, Doug Kenrick and uh, Stephen Newberg. We wrote a textbook in social psychology, and we were flying to a sales meeting for the publisher of our book. And uh, we were seated in three across in a row, and uh, the the, uh, the attendant, a very attractive young woman, uh, came and took our drink orders for uh, you know, and uh, each uh, uh, of my colleagues ordered orange juice, no ice. That's my drink. But I ordered apple juice with ice to stand out. Interesting. <laughs> if that had been some guy, yes, right, you would have like orange juice. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, it was it, no, it, it had to do with that. Yeah. So standing out, though. Look, see, look, look. <laughs> yeah, but standing out. What is that? Is that a kind of form of status? Like I, I'm different, or I'm, I'm different from these guys over here? And, and does status go into the liking category? Yeah, well, it's it's just at its most primitive sense, it's being not in competition with other people, with with being in, in uh, you want to stand out and not be like all the other candidates so that there's some form of differentiation for you. We actually did a study um, where we used one of two kinds of uh, uh, persuasive ads to visit the San Francisco Museum of Art. And uh, it one was San Francisco Museum of Art. M many people have already experienced the wonders of it, right? So social proof. The other was be one of the few who can experience the wonders of this, uh, this, uh, gem of a hidden gem of a opportunity right essentially scarcity stand out versus stand with the crowd versus stand away from the crowd we we, we got more people to take the stand out uh ad uh, 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 and and follow it if we first played them a clip from a romantic movie in a romantic state of mind, in an amorous state of mind, you choose to stand away from the crowd, not 
in the crowd with all those competitors. Yeah. Yeah, but I suppose uh, you wouldn't want to be too far out of the crowd. Like you're a, you're you're a member of some weird fringe uh, cult or crazy group or you know QAnon or something like that. Maybe we don't go go down the QAnon path, but uh, you know that's that that's one of those things where. <laughs> No. Well, now something as weird as that yeah. is now acceptable by what, 30% of Republicans that they think there's something to it. Otherwise, come on, that would never catch on if you didn't have enough people around you going, I think there's something to it. Then you're like, all right, I guess everybody else right. is going along with it. Yeah, of course. I, I think that's exactly right. There are always going to be limiting conditions on these things. But in general, in the great majority of, uh, of ways to stand out, um, yeah, you're going to choose those in an amorous state of mind when, you, when you're in there. All right, you added to your, your list uh, unity in the new book, and I'm glad you did that because that's super important. Uh-huh. I mean, it turn, it, we're recording this, you know, when the, uh, yesterday the, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel declared a ceasefire. Okay, we have this massive uh, tension going on, and, and it's kind of a unity problem. It's, it's you know, we want to be unified. We want to like our fellow group members. But, you know, Paul Bloom makes this point in his book Against Empathy that, you know, empathy is not just this golden uh, emotion that, 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 that can only lead to good. The more bonded I am with my fellow in-group members, the, the more dangerous people are in the other group that might be threatening our group. So I'm even more hostile because I care so much about my in-group member. Anyway, that's his basic argument. But I was thinking about that with your unity chapter on, you know, how do you resolve something like the the Middle East crisis, when you have two groups that are very unified within their group, but you know, there's hostility between them. Well, I've seen one study that offers an interesting, uh, and again, uh, uh, evolutionarily uh, friendly explanation. If you show Palestinians, or, or no, it was Israeli Arabs versus is, is Israeli Jews, evidence that they have a great amount of um, genetic overlap. They become more sympathetic to one another's position. So, yeah, you, it, it's not just any commonality. Oh, look, I, brown eyes. N- no. It has to be something that tells them, oh, we shouldn't be undermining the success, the welfare of these individuals. They have copies of our genes. That really worked. I guess that must be tapping something deep about who we really think is a member of our family, our inner circle honorary members of our tribe. Right. Because they're like us, literally. They're of us. Of us. I'm going to make that That's distinction. That's a great way to put it. They're of yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I can have uh, a friend at work who is like me in taste for uh, ethnic food and movies and sense of humor and, uh, you know, uh, favorite uh, artists and a and a brother who has shares none of that with me there's no question who i would consider like me and who i would consider of me and as we know from the research there's no question who would get my assistance over the other in especially as we go to more harrowing c- circumstances where survival is an issue, it isn't even close. Who gets the one? Uh, 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 what the ring that you s- throw out in the water? For, oh, right. the, <laughs> for life, the life to, ring. Yes. Know, if you're in the boat and there are two people, life preserver. You, who gets it? There's just no question who gets it. Right. So it, it's. All right, what are the factors that cause people to define themselves as in a unit uh, 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 in, in which they define themselves and their identity? Well, family is one. Another is commonality of locale, place, 
commonality of place is one of those things that has evolved because at a, we, we grew up in small bands and clans and tribes, of people as a, as a species, right? 50 or so traveling around. Those people who were around us in place were usually people who shared our genetic makeup. And so what we find is that those individuals who, there's something called a localism, who can be seen as of us locally. So for example, people are significantly more likely to answer a, a, a questionnaire, a survey for no money, if the survey emanated from a university in their state than a university outside of their state. During the war in Afghanistan, if a U.S. soldier was killed, they became significantly more likely to oppose the war if it was a soldier from their state than a, a bordering state. We favor those who share locales with us and, of course, uh, familiar, uh, familial kinds of link. What about language? You know, that's a, a, you know, I don't know if anybody's looked at that, but I bet it, oh, there is a study. There is a study where uh, people who are going to visit a, pr a particular country, right, um, are more persuaded by somebody who is speaking, this was done in the United States, English to describe that study than somebody who's speaking, I think it was Sweden, speaking English with a Swedish accent. Even though you would think, oh, that person's going to be more knowledgeable. No, this is the person who's more of me, as, il as indicated by commonality of language. That's here, right. Here I'm thinking about cultural this. differences that, yeah. for example, I remember the scene this bumper sticker saying, why the hell should I press one for English? <laughs> In other words, English is the American language. This is what we speak, and I'm not, I don't, I don't want any of this Spanish. Well, you know, you're in Arizona, I'm in California, you, Spanish is everywhere. Uh, but my wife's yeah. from Germany, and you know, go, yeah. you know, we travel to Europe before the pandemic, and you know, you hear languages all over the place. No one would complain about, oh, those people are speaking. Well, maybe the French would complain about <laughs> Americans speaking only English, but <laughs> but in other words, I, yeah. I think it's more of a of an American thing to say we're defining ourselves in part by our language, whereas maybe European countries would not put that high up on the list of important characteristics of our unity. Because many of them are speak more than one language, are multilingual. Many of them, <laughs> you know. Uh, so yeah. All right, I got a crazy thought experiment for you here. Okay, so tomorrow, uh, your um, your company and, and your or your office gets a call from the the White House, and uh, President Biden. No, no, somebody comes on the line and says, Doctor Cialdini, please hold the line for President Biden. <laughs> and then President Biden comes on and says, All right, Doctor Cialdini. I'm going to host a meeting at the White House with Israelis and Palestinians. Can you tell me what we should do? Apply your principles so that we can make some progress here. Yeah. Well, first I would say, okay, who is this really? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> who is this? <laughs> is this Michael? <laughs> Are you pranking me? Punking you, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to describe a study that was done by uh, my now past colleague, Lee Ross. Oh, God, I, he just passed away this past. Lovely man, brilliant man. So he does a study among Israelis and Palestinians. on a, There's a certain amount of money that um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to give you uh, to barter. Where does the money go? You can send it to uh, Palestine uh, to uh, enhance uh, education or uh, various uh, uh, enhancements there, or you can send it to Israel to increase security. So de decide on uh, the, uh, how to uh, split the money. Okay. And in a great number of cases, and I'm trying to remember 
now what the number is, but it's over 50%, well over 50%. There's no, nobody wins. If they can't come to a mutual agreement, there's no money. So now both sides say, I would rather walk away from this interaction than to give you an advantage. Unless Ross uh, says one thing to them before they begin, which is, you know, I know this is going to be a difficult negotiation, but many of our groups have worked through those difficulties and come to a, 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 a mutually agreeable uh, outcome. Now, stymie negotiations drop precipitously because they're told something about social proof. This is, this is not only something that other people do. It's something that's feasible. Stay in your seats, right? These other people, when they did it, were able to push through those seemingly uh, impossible barriers to scale, all right, to, to clear. Right? So I think you don't have to necessarily say uh, a lot of people. You can say, you know, in the past, we have come to, and then point to examples of situations in the past where they've come to agreements, these sides, or similar kinds of contra uh, uh, of contestants in uh, one or another situation. It, does, uh, it can be a bargaining situation, it could be a war, it could be... People have come together to do this. They push through, it's possible. So you give people evidence of feasibility of doing this. Other people have done it. Give them prominent examples of it. And I can't remember the the percentages now, but they made my jaw drop. And it was for real money that was going to one or another of these camps. Yeah, yeah I wonder... Um, that's what I would do. Yeah, that's, that's a good start. <laughs> uh, to what extent these, yeah. these are sacred values on each side that, say, money is, is not going to be an affecting issue. Uh, you know, it'd be like asking somebody, well, you know, how, how much can I pay you to have sex or something like that? Not a sex worker, say. Well, nothing. Yeah. I, I I don't sell my body here. It's the same problem people yeah, have with yeah. um, uh, like selling organs. Well, I got two kidneys. Why can't I sell one? That just feels wrong. It's like that's that's not the kind of thing you should pay for. Uh, you know, there's anthropologists that study this stuff. Like, you know, if I come over to your house for dinner, you invite me over and and I offer to pay you. You'd be like, that's just so inappropriate. I mean, no, you shouldn't pay me. Or if I go to a restaurant and I say, I'm not going to pay you, but I'll have you over to my house for dinner. It's like, what? No, you should pay me. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I'll serve something better than this. <laughs> yeah. You know, so in, You'll in, get a in, deal. in the case of Palestine and, and, and Israel, I mean, in, in a way, this is going to oversimplify it, but you got two guys with the same with a deed to the same piece of land. And the title company is the holy book or God, or, you know, it's some sacred thing that there's no court of appeal you can go to. There's no title company you can say, wait, you know, who has the paper trail for that particular piece of land there? Uh, historically, maybe you could do that, but, you know, historically, all lands, you know, belong to somebody else. I live in Santa Barbara. Well, this used to belong to the Chumash Indians, and then the Spanish had it, then the Mexicans had it, and then the Americans said, you owe us money, and we're taking it. So, and you're in Arizona, mm -hmm. same problem, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So who really owns the land? Well, you know, it's just sort of by default who has the bigger gun or army or whatever. But in the case of this one, right. it seems like maybe there's no amount of uh, money or any other benefits that the United States could offer to Israel or Palestine. If you'll give up this and maybe the two-state solution and, and we're going to provide more, more well, aid or whatever, it could be they go, you're putting a price on something that can't have a price. Well, let me give you one more example of what might work, because according to uh, Henry Kissinger, who was considered at the time our, the U.S. best international negotiator, somebody once asked him, so in your 
experience, who have you seen that you think is the best international negotiator? And he nominated Anwar Sadat, former president of Egypt. And the interviewer said, but why? He said, he gave his bargaining opponents a reputation to live up to before the negotiations began. Let's say he's bargaining with the Israelis and they have all the military advantage here. They've just won the seven day war or whatever it was, the six day war, right? And all the, the, right? So he doesn't have power. He would say, you know, I'm so glad that uh, I'm bargaining with people from Israel because everybody knows how important, given your history, how important it is to Israelis for fairness and equanimity and recognizing how being uh, out of favor disempowers you and makes things unfair. So I'm very glad. So he, and Kissinger said he would give them this reputation, right, of not not exploiting the power in terms of fairness, right? And he said they would do it. He said, I would watch it every day. Now, I don't know that that, you know, it's an anecdote, right? But I do know that there's evidence that if you give people a particular reputation for, let's say, a helpful individual, this was a study done, people were called on the phone and told at random, you know, in their neighborhoods, we are doing some surveys in your neighborhood, and we found we're asking people who is the, who do you think is the most helpful of your neighbors? Your name keeps coming up. Right? They just <laughs> drop that right. into people's right. consciousness. A week later, somebody from the United Way comes to their door. Those people who have been given the reputation as helpful give more money than those who didn't get that call. So people live up to the reputation you give to them. And I think maybe today that might work as well. Yeah, interesting. Well, I hope so. It seems to be a never ending problem and it's above my pay grade to solve it. But I want to ask you a couple other kind of broad questions. Um, first of all, just a quickie, because I don't know, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of free will and determinism, but with these influencing powers, so it's influence, not determinism. Right. You, I, I presume you, you uh, think people have some sort of volition, like you can throw all these influencing factors at me. But at some point, if I know you're doing it, I can override it kind of a free won't. Uh, so I still have some free degrees of freedom in that equation of your seven different factors. It's not determining me. I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's kind of how I read. No, no, that's ac- absolutely the case. These seven factors optimize the likelihood of success, but never guarantee it. Never. No. All right, another big question. on uh, To what extent uh, humans are naturally uh, gullible and we fall for these kinds of things, or we're naturally skeptical and it takes a lot of work? You've got to put all those principles uh, at work, and still it's hard to get people to come around. You know, in, in psychology, this is kind of a longstanding debate. You know, Kahneman and Tversky famously, you know, did all this research and and Danny won the Nobel Prize for this, you know, showing how irrational we are. I mean, just how loaded with all these biases, you know, and my job as skeptic, it just seems like everybody in the world believes some crazy thing. Right. But on the other hand, you know, people like Gert uh, Gingerinzer says, well, no, no, it's the context in which you present these thought experiments. Yeah. And if you present it in a way that it's more socially constructed, say you're in a room with some other people and you have to make this decision or that decision, as opposed to like a logic puzzle where you have to, you know, the famous Wasson test where you have four cards and two of them have letters and two of them have numbers. And there's this rule. If this one has a letter, then this number has to be behind it. Which ones do you, you know, flip to test it? You know, people are notoriously terrible at these kinds of thought experiments, but if you flip it and say, you're a, you're a, um, a bartender or you're the bouncer at a bar and you got to figure out who's who you should card who you should check because you don't have time to check everybody right you know so is it the person that's uh that looks under 18 is it the person that's drinking a beer or drinking a coke you know who do you ask and it turns out people are much better at you know in the bar situation because this is how we evolved we evolved to be with other people and interact with other people whereas these logic probability you know t- 
people are notoriously terrible about estimating probabilities of things happening. Even medical doctors are terrible at that problem of, uh, you know, you have a positive test for breast cancer, here's the false, po false positive rate, you know, and then it's like the, the correct answer is like 2% and the, and the answer everybody gives is like 90%. Uh, I forget the exact details of it, but, uh, but this is the idea that, you know, are we rational in the right context or, or, or how susceptible are we? Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a great uh, study by uh, Cosmides and Tubi that helps ex uh, exemplify what you've just said. It depends on the context. Uh, so, for example, if you give people difficult uh, problems, uh, math problems, uh, so it's this factor and then there's this and then there's that over here. Now, give me the, the outcome. Give me, give me the right answer. What's the right answer? How many oranges do you have left? Right. Yeah. They do. Pay, they do terribly at it, unless you put it in a situation that somebody's trying to cheat you out of oranges. And then, you suddenly become a better. You're more accurate at pretty because there's some kind of system that gets activated that when somebody is trying to cheat us or be dishonest with us. Up come these resources, up come these uh, uh, abilities to identify what the proper response is. Because when we're cheated, we're, you know, we're, we're diminished, right? Now that's a, then you get, they get the, the right answer more. So I think that's the way to think about it. what What's the context? What's the situation in which you're, in and there are going to be systems at work that decide whether we're going to be skeptical or or gullible based on what we know about the situation uh, and the people in it. Yeah, I was thinking about this also reading your book, this larger question of um, of persuasion and influence uh, in the context of things like cults. Uh, you know, you discussed Jonestown, yeah. and I, I think you mentioned Heaven's Gate, and uh, you could throw in Nexium as a more recent yeah. example. Uh, and a Scientology or whatever, yeah. you know, I, I mean, and, and we read these and think, how could people be so gullible to do that? And, and, and yet, you know, of, of the thousands of religious groups, self-help groups and so on, almost none of them turn out to be cults. And by the way, I like to say no one in the history of the world has ever joined a cult, right? They join a group that they think is a good thing. This is going to help me. We're going to help the poor. Yeah, right. You know, and, and, and Jones himself was, you can look up pictures of uh, the 1960s, where he's there with in 70s with Jerry Brown, the governor of California, right? Because he yeah. was doing a lot of yeah. uh, a, a good a charity work and social work in San Francisco to help the poor and minorities, people of color. I mean, today we would say, well, he's a social justice warrior if he hadn't moved to South America and, and, and poisoned everybody. Uh, you know, so uh, there is that. So to, just to talk a little bit about Jonestown and to what extent, you know, all any of us are that gullible or maybe not. Maybe it takes a huge effort to get people to do something like that. Yeah, it takes something special. And you, if you look at the literature on cults, there are particular points of time when people are most vulnerable to being recruited into a cult. It's when there's been a break in their lives. They, they're, they're uncertain about what they should do. They don't have a sense of belonging. They've just moved from home to uh, another city, maybe to go to school, to get a first job. They've just had a breakup with one of their romantic partners, and they're alone. And uh, they're looking, they're casting about for some kind of stability. And along comes the cult recruiter or recruiters, promising them so, uh, 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 stability in terms of a goal. I mean, this is, look what we are trying to do. Look what we are committed to. This is a way to align yourself with something that's stable and, 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 and positive. And you've got belonging there. There's the first strategy that's called love bombing. They get positive uh, 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 accord uh, constantly from them. And then they are asked to move themselves away from any other source of approval or information. Everything has to go within the, the group so that now 
you can't leave without leaving your approval. The, the source of the only approval you have is inside that group. Um, there are two kinds of individuals who, um, back in the day when there were these cult deprogrammers, right, who would get people out, they would say there are two kinds of people who leave cult cults. There are takeaways, people who literally get pulled away by some deep programmer and, and deprogrammed and, and uh, physically moved. They, they actually get, yeah. I mean, they don't do that no, anymore it's because it's kidnapping. Yeah. Right. And then there are walkaways. And what differentiates the walkaways? They have stayed connected to their friends and family so that all the information has, is no longer in a barrel that they're in. And social proof from outside is still available to move them away. Uh, so those are, yeah, and, 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 and so I, I do see it as very much a social, belonging, unity, social proof kind of. Uh, also, there's scarcity in there because they give you information that this is the one true way. You can't get to this goal any other way than through our <clears throat> surfaces. <clears throat> and ministries, those are the factors that um, instantiate. They, they, they allow people to, uh, to recruit and then maintain membership in those groups. Yeah, which is why a lot of these cults don't want you to talk to other people. Or they want you to disown your family, break away from your family. They're evil. They don't want you to be here because they don't want you to know the truth that we have. You know, the fundamentalist That's Mormons, right. I've been, uh, something we've studied, because I, I know some former Mormons, Foremans, they're called. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, but just the regular Mormon is, uh, Mormonism is, is not really a cult, I don't think. But the fundamentalist Mormons, where they still practice polygamy uh, in these kind of border states between Colorado and northern Arizona, Utah, and so on. Uh, and I've been yeah. to some of these, right. uh, been through those, some of those places. They're, they're kind of creepy. It's like a, a, a Twilight Zone set. Uh, where, mm. you know, the, the women are mostly isolated. And here, one of these deeper questions I, I always like to probe is uh, on the, uh, to what extent an adult can make a adult decision. In, in this case, these women that say, I love being a sister wife to this guy. And, you know, I don't want to be, a, a, live in a monogamous society. I like a polygamous society. Yeah, but you've been told that since you were five years old. You know, you can't possibly know what, you know, a rational choice would be uh, in the context yeah. of having all these degrees of freedom. Let's use that again. Option two, if you don't even know what those options are, um, you know, to me, I don't know. That that that, that seems like, uh, you know, too much influence on, on these girls. Also, all of their approval comes from being there, from wanting to be in that situation. All of their belongingness, their unity with the group comes from that set of behaviors and choices that they make. They hardly, um, hard, hardly independent choices, but nonetheless, they make these choices and it produces a sense of commitment with, to be consistent with what they've already chosen because of these factors. And I don't think they really recognize that they could, if they step back from it, they would see the extent to which all of this was scripted. Well, in a polygamous society, you have the additional problem of, the, of what do you do with the extra young men? You know, if one guy has two or more wives, that, that means there's somebody else that doesn't have any wives. And they have to get rid of these guys because, you know, they come of age and they go, well, I want, you know, I want to be married. I want to have a partner. And, uh, you yeah. know, the old guy down the street has eight wives. Well, okay, so there's, there's seven guys that are walking around with nobody. And you know, so then they get kicked out, and then they don't know what to do because they they, they, they have out. no life. You know, this was their whole life. Everything, all the principles you talk about, yeah. plus financial independence, very difficult. You know, I once gave a lecture to the, a, a cult uh, aware the cult awareness network. It was overseas, and and and, and the uh, the title was "You don't have to be a dupe to be duped." Uh, you don't have to be a fool to be fooled. 
if you step back and, and look at the principles of influence, they're the same ones that are being used on us by General Mills and General Motors and General Foods, all the generals, <laughs> right? Uh, but they, they get to use those principles inside this barrel. It's like shooting fish in that barrel for them. They, they, those people can't get out. They can't, av- they can't escape those messages and that messaging system the way we can uh, messages from General Mills about the value of their Cheerios or whatever it is. Yeah. Did you follow very closely the Nexium cult? You know, the, that guy, uh, Rainier, who had, it was kind of, a, kind of a sex cult. Uh, he's in jail now. But, you know, it was mostly women uh, that ended up getting this uh, branding in their groin area where, you know, like literally just a burned in brand uh, that they belong to him or whatever. I remember seeing, uh, I forget the name of the ABC journalist, uh, a woman who is basically talking to these other women saying, I, I got to be blunt with you. This guy's just a dweeby looking, you know, nobody. What What's the attraction? I don't get it. <laughs> and, you know, then it was interesting to kind of see them, you know, post hoc after the fact, trying to rationalize, why did I do that? And to me, it looked mostly like social proof. It wasn't that, you know, they were drawn yeah. to him. It was like, well, all the other women in my group, they're, they're all going to do this. And in fact, it, uh, yeah. this guy, Rainier, he had some underling, a little bit like Jeffrey Epstein's um, girlfriend. Uh, uh, yeah. Jazine, uh, Jal- I forget her name now, but... Uh, yeah, Jolene. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That she was doing the recruiting. Something. So there, you kind of see that social proof, and yeah. you know, well, this this must be okay because these these women are like me, and and they're doing it, so I guess I can do it. Less than that. Oh, this guy is is so powerful. I just want to have sex with him. Yeah, that's exactly what my uh, impression was too, because I did watch the series, and it, the recruitment was being done by other women, not by this Ranieri guy. You know. It, it was, there wasn't a man in the process at all. It was all other women. Uh, so it's comparable, multiple others. Right. Okay, another one of my little um, things I think about on this podcast. So apologies to my listeners who have heard this before. But to what extent are any of us potential Nazis? You know, I was reading, I had Hugo Mercier in the podcast. His book is not born yesterday, so he's pushing back yeah. against this idea that we're gullible, we're susceptible. Any of us could be turned into goose-stepping Nazis tomorrow. we got to be careful. He says, no, no, no. It's way harder than you think. And he has whole sections on, I know you know his work, you know, political advertising is generally not very effective. Uh, you know, cults have a hard time recruiting. You know, Mormons or you know, Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, they send out missionaries. They almost never convert anybody. It's really hard to convert people. And that, you know, it took a special series of circumstances to go from, you know, cultured, educated, uh, you know, Western Germans to goose-stepping Nazis. You know, it took a, 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 a very unlikely that that could happen here or something like that in some European country because of all the things that have to come together at just the right moment. So how do you think about those kind of bigger issues? Well, I think about them in terms of Malcolm Gladwell's notion of the tipping point. Uh, it is difficult, but when you get to the tipping point, it just flows. That's the point at which everybody is much more easily swept into the situation. In, in uh, Nazi Germany, pre-war, um, there was a lot of uh, propaganda against Jews in one form or another, and including the art, arts community, especially artists, uh, uh, not you know who who did uh, paintings and sculpture and so on, and there was <clears throat> a, a, a genuine concern about the, this among German Jews who were artists, but who kept they they stayed in Germany in those pre year uh, pre war years until there was this uh, exhibition that the, um, uh, the, the Nazis put up uh, of uh, uh, Jewish art that was to be reviled. They had this exhibition and people came in to see uh, how corrupt and corrupting uh, the, the, uh, 
the uh, the products of the artistic mind would be within uh, uh, a Jewish artist. And what was surprising was the number of people who went into that exhi exhibition. It was crowded. And that's what sent many of the artists out. They said, okay, we can resist the government because governments are temporary. Governments are authoritarian. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're not normal ways in which we interact. But if the people are against us, we have to get out. There's no, there's no, there's no check now against the excesses of government. We have to get out. So at that tipping point, when that was recognized, and then, yeah, it was the case that the majority of Germans were, if not uh, chest-banging Nazis, they were along for the ride. And the question you asked at the outset, would you have been one of those? Michael, I don't know. I don't know either. I know. I mean, people, I ask my students, you know, would you, would you, uh, if you were in Milgram's experiment, would you go all the way to 450? Oh, no, of course I wouldn't. You know, if you lived in 1850s America, would you right. have been a slavery abolitionist in the South? Oh, sure, of course I would. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I think that's kind of delusional. <laughs> you know, you just don't know. Yeah, would you have burned witches? Right, yeah. You know, right, yeah. Exactly. Yes, yeah, we can't say. That's why I'm against this cancel culture idea of judging people based on you know, uh, standards we established, you know, last week, uh, you know, on how they lived 200 right. years ago or 50 years ago or, or, or whatever. Uh, you also talk about pluralistic ignorance in the book. I think here, this is also another factor. You know, if you think that everybody else thinks a certain way, so maybe these artists are thinking, well, everybody's like this, uh, therefore we got to get out. Maybe, maybe not everybody's like that. You just think everybody's like that. The famous experiment with asking college right. students, you know, do you like binge drinking? If you ask them alone, they go, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't like binge drinking. But I know everybody else likes it, so I go along with it. You know, so you, yeah, you get this right. thing hanging in the air yeah. and sort of, you know, uh, you know, just like like in the ether, uh, without anybody actually supporting it. And so maybe you know, because the Nazis came to power on a minority party, but then they shut down the press, they locked up anybody who dissented. So you have not just pluralistic ignorance because you don't hear any dissenting views, but you see your neighbors being hauled right, off to right. the concentration camps. So you think I'm just right. going to keep my mouth shut. You also, you also see your neighbors standing by and not protesting in any force, forcible way. And, that's, and then you assume <clears throat> they must be on board, even though they may be saying the same thing because you're standing by. That's the essence of pluralistic interest a failure to recognize what is truly going on in the minds of the people around you who, because you're both assessing this quietly and privately rather than having an external conversation or confrontation on the topic. Yeah, interesting. Another point David Buss made was that at UT Austin, where he teaches the, and the entire University of Texas system now, is that if you see some Buddy doing something that's you know racist or misogynistic or it's sexual assault or not just sexual assault if you know you hear somebody making a an off color sex joke to a a student female student by a male professor or a employee to the employer to the employee you know and you don't say anything you're in trouble so there the laws is kind of going for the bystander. Now, I can see why that would be a good thing yeah. in a way. It encourages people to come forward if they see something. On the other hand, that makes me nervous. It's like that's how, you know, East Germany during the Cold War with the Stasi worked. I mean, something like 40 percent of the entire population was involved in the state of spying on each other. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree, I, I, especially on the side of now you will be penalized. I would much rather stack the uh, the incentives on the side of you'll be approved. I mean, you, that's something that we as a community uh, uh, decide is a, a good thing to do, at least to report it. Doesn't have to be that means it's true, but we should know what's going on, and uh, we need your eyes and ears. Uh, th thank you for that. 
Yeah. So um, again, I think you know if you have a few factors that work like that, it's not that we're stupidly gullible and anybody could be a goose stepping Nazi. It's that you know, there's there's certain factors that have to come together. I do think I agree. No Hitler, no Holocaust. No Hitler, no World War II. I don't. I think none of that would have happened because he was so influential uh, at that particular time. Given all those historical circumstances, the Treaty of Versailles was a terrible treaty, and then the Depression, and on and on and on, all that stuff. Um, you know, it seems like okay. You mentioned uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I wanted to bring that up because his late, latest book, which I enjoy, I enjoy all of Malcolm's books. He's such a great writer, uh, and I agree with you know his critics that you know he's plucking out like one social psych experiment or one cognitive psych experiment and then spinning a whole story around it, that's problematic for sure. So his latest book, Talking to Strangers, he's plucked out this idea of default to truth. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this, you know, that when we meet somebody, we just naturally believe them. And it, of course, Hitler was his, uh, his star example, and he was severely criticized by historians and psychologists saying, you know, yes, Ch Chamberlain seemed to believe him, maybe not really, but you know, but most Western leaders did not just believe Hitler. They were skeptical. of him. So I just want to get your thoughts on to what extent when we meet somebody, do we just believe them? Do we default to truth or do we default to skepticism or do we default to nothing? Well, I think we um, <clears throat> hold our, hold our, our, our uh, counsel until we see what the evidence is. I mean, I would take a, a neutral position. Uh, in that regard, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be skeptical uh, to the point of assuming the worst. I don't want to do that. I mean, I don't want to be that kind of skeptic. I want to be one who says, I, I, you know, I need some more evidence here, and then I will choose based on that information. It's the way to think about it. Yeah, that's advice I give my students uh, when I. When I Electron cults, you know, if, if, the, if you get this phone call, if somebody's trying to get you to give them their, your credit card or your bank account number or whatever, just, just say, listen, I, I, I'm going to have to call you back. I, I, I got I to gotta talk to my parents about this or I got to talk to my spouse if you're older and so on. And, and, and that's just a way of kind of breaking that off, it's just a, a strategy to avoid this. Right. Right. All right, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, during the Derek Chauvin trial, we all saw that video shot by the 13-year-old girl that I, I hadn't seen before with not just Derek Chauvin with his knee on George Floyd's neck, but four other officers standing there just watching. What is going through their minds? What are they thinking? What, why didn't one of them go over there and say, Derek, we, we have the situation under control. You, could, you can let up now. My understanding was that <clears throat> they were on a training run with him, that they were essentially rookies, and they were, they were assigned to follow him around. I mean, I think at, at there was a set of maybe three of them, maybe uh, two or three of them were in that situation. And he was the authority, not just somebody who was an authority above them, he was not just a, in authority, but he was an authority. He knew the he knew the the ropes. He understood how you do this, and so I can understand that. Then, if another a police officer or two come along, they see now three people standing there doing nothing, uh, and, and so it, it accumulates. Uh, but the what was what was striking to me was that. There were uh, bystanders who were protesting, who weren't under the guise that this was some some training uh, experience for them. No, no, this is wrong. This and and those people shouting at this uh, Chauvin, I think had, if I look at his posture, it wasn't just a knee on the neck looking down. He was looking up. In defiance, I think there was psychological reactance there. You can't tell me what to do. I'm in charge here. Don't tell me. And this, and I, I think it's regrettable, but the fact that he, he was getting resistance caused him to feel that he was not going to bend. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the impression I got, too. Yeah, that's a good observation. 
on the posture. It was very defiant. Um, yeah, so if you're going to recommend police training modifications, maybe encourage all police to be uh, willing to challenge the authority, the boss, the, the chief, the captain, whoever's there with you that's above you. Uh, I remember that w when one of those Asian airlines crashed, and, and you know, one of the factors was the co-pilot could see there was a problem, but he was afraid to say something to the pilot because the pilot's the boss. And so they, they had retraining, like, no, no, you say something if you see something, even if it's the boss. Yeah. Yeah. For police, I think I would go back even further before training, uh, and that is to recruitment and the testing process of who we let in. It seems to me that there are, uh, this is a gross oversimplification, but let's go with it. There are uh, police officers, and I'm going to, from my own interactions with them, although I'm a white male, so they, they are committed to uh, protect, uh, serving and protecting, right? This is what they do. This is why they're involved. On the side of the car. And then there's a, yeah, yeah. And then there's a set of them who really like um, dominating and controlling the situation. That's what the job gives them. And people who have that inclination are the ones who we find doing these kinds of things, who become enraged if anybody challenges them. That's where you see, if, if you look at these these clips, they, they go off like into this irrational rage and start doing things out of proportion to what's required in that situation because somebody is challenging their ability to control and dominate. It's those people we have to identify and weed out of the recruitment process in the first place. And then I think we have a, a better chance at doing training for those who perceive their major orientation as uh, serve and protect. That would seem to be an argument against that uh, a p policing is inherently racist, that the institution itself is rotten to the core. And instead, it flips it, says that people are self-selecting, that the bad ones are self-selecting to go into a profession where they can be badasses and lord it over people because they got a badge and a gun. What are you going to do? Uh, and maybe these are the dark triad people, or, or if nothing else, maybe they, they need the psychopathy checklist to take uh, before they start training, just to weed them out. So you're, you're out. You scored too high on the psychopathy test. Yeah, and I would add, once again, n no one thing is ever going to uh, 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 explain a situation. So I wouldn't be surprised if those people who have that approach are also racist <laughs> and if, yes. and if I, anybody from a minority group challenges their dominance they go they fly into this rage like somebody who isn't racist which hey you know if you believe you belong down there and i belong up here then you don't get to challenge me that exacer exacerbates yeah. the the problem yeah and, yeah and you know part of the training i think is to control the situation this is what i've been this is our job. If there's a problem, there's a domestic dispute, you go to the house, the husband and wife are screaming at each other. Your job is to get control, separate them, calm everybody down. So that idea that I got to control the situation while I'm here, you can see what happens when somebody bolts and they run. Well, oh, we can't let that happen. Right. We're losing control. Here, I th I'm thinking of the, the guy, the, the black man that was in the uh, line at Wendy's in, in Atlanta, fell asleep, right? So they call the police, they come and they wake him up and yeah. You know, for 45 minutes, they're just talking to the guys. It's a normal conversation, and, and everybody's friendly. And then yeah. they decide, well, we're going we're gonna to have to arrest you and cuff you. And he panics and runs, and they shoot him. You know, at this point, they had the keys to his car. They knew where he lived. It's like, why do you right. just let him go? Just get him right. later. If your orientation is serve and protect the, the, the populace, how is the populace at risk? From some guy who fell asleep in the car, you're not you're not undermining your principal orientation to protect, right? You are if your principal orientation is to control and dominate. 
yeah so that's the way we really have to we have to recruit and uh prioritize serve and protect and what that means in any one given situation like that one as an example protect lives which lives all lives yeah and uh yeah, and again, you know, in terms of physically controlling somebody, I've, I've never tried to do this. I would have no idea how to do it. I guess they must get some training. But Jocko Wilnick, the ex-Navy SEAL, with his own podcast, he talks about this, that, you know, in the Navy SEALs, they practice this like every week or every month. You know, you, you're grappling, physically grappling with somebody. Down on the ground you go, how do you gain control over this guy? And, you know, it's very emotionally disruptive. It's upsetting if you're not used to it. You know, then it's just, and, you know, sec- you know it, all, all these things play out in a matter of seconds, right. and then the gun comes out. Right. <laughs> and I don't know the good solution to that, because, you know, I'm not in that business. But Well, obviously- uh, Navy SEALs, Navy SEALs, I don't mind them uh, needing to get in control, because they're, they're bad guys. But uh, police, that's, there's, most of us are good people. <laughs> And so you, you, it's serve and protect. Kevin Dutton, the psychologist, has a, a funny story in his book. He has a book on good, uh, positive psychopathy. Um, and uh, so he talks about the recruitment of uh, special forces in England, where, you know, they want the baddest ass guys they can get, right? So they put a, basically all the training is just to weed out anybody that's not just a hardcore badass. And the last test is they have this guy on the ground, he's blindfolded, he's face down, and they fire up this big truck engine you know, right, like 10 feet away from him. And then they take a tire, a huge tire, and they roll it right up to his head and they see if he panics or not. And if he let, and if he makes that one, like, I don't care if there's a truck going to run me over. It's like, that's our guy. That's the guy we want. Wow. wow. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> he does make the point okay. that, you know, that some <laughs> of the psychopathy traits are good. You know, high risk taking, uh, you're not risk averse. Uh, you don't care what other people think about you. You're just going to do what you think is the right thing to do. You know, if you're a politician, a CEO, or a corporation, a Wall Street trader, maybe those are good. You're not. You don't want to be a serial killer. You don't want to beat people up. You know, you're just a, a super uber competitor. You know, maybe that's the guy you want. Like, if you want a lawyer, you want a, a badass yeah. lawyer, right? If you want to win, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, well. Robert, we've been going almost two hours here. This is just a fantastic conversation. I just want to get your kind of just a general overview of how optimistic you are about society now. You're roughly my age, and we can kind of look back and track moral progress. The arc of the you know moral universe is bending toward justice, you know, my metaphor for my book. The expanding moral sphere, moral circle, like Peter Singer talks about. You know, we, we've been on the right track for a long time, but now all of a sudden, you know, the BLM movement and the anti-racism movement and and it's, and the Me Too movement and others are saying, no, no, the, you know, society is rotten to the core. We got to tear the whole thing down and start over. This, is, this has been a terrible experiment. I, I just want to get your, your, your opinion of kind of the bigger picture here of, you know, where we are, where we can go. Obviously, we have a lot of progress still to go. There's still badass people out there, you know, and they're still racist and misogynist. And, you know, the, the Me Too, you know, w- women have never had it so good. And yet they're still misogynistic assholes in, in companies and so on. It still happens. Uh, you know, how do you balance that out? You know, I'm going to say that I'm uh, pessimistic uh, and then optimistic for the same reason, technology. The technology that we have evolved over the last, oh, geez, what, 30 years? has just been remarkable in allowing us to balkanize ourselves from one another. Where we get the information, where we go, what we, where we prefer to get the information, we are essentially making ourselves like those cult members who only see one side and get that reinforced and get it approved and get to feel belonging in those, those silos, the, you know, uh, conceptual and, I- and identity silos. Uh, and, and, you know, I would have thought that the pandemic would have brought us together because it's, it's affecting all of us. I was astounded how we were able to, as a society, uh, politicize those choices uh, in ways that just didn't seem uh, to make sense in any other way than 
the unity principle and the people feeling that there was more moral approval associated with loyalty to your group than for truth or fairness, right? Uh-huh. What's on your plate for your next big project? What are you working on? Well, you know, I, I think uh, there are um, two. One is one of the best features of the of the previous editions of Influence have been called reader's reports, where people write in to us and tell us what they have already seen or what's happened to them. Right? And um, I would like to get a, an array of those to make a book of it. Just all those examples that people have seen in their daily lives and for me to comment on each one in terms of what it means in terms of the psychology of persuasion. Yeah, that's great. That's that was one of my favorite parts of the book was the, the reader's letters you got. You know, oh, I saw social proof at work, and here's yeah. what happened to me, and I fell for it, or whatever. Right, right. <laughs> yes, well. All right, well, Robert, thank I, you. I've enjoyed this very yeah, much. Thank you so much yeah. for your time. You're one of the most interesting people working today in this area. I loved uh, talking to you about that. So uh, uh, thank you so much, and congratulations on the new edition of the book. So long for now, Michael. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed our interactions uh, more than you know.